Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast, where we sit down and have real conversations with business leaders that have been where you are. During these interviews, we'll dive into what it takes to improve systems and champion processes that maximize performance. Each week, our trailblazing guests share their experiences and understanding of the workforce to help inspire change, challenge our thinking, and share what it takes to successfully travel the road to profitability. Now here's our host, co-founder and chief evangelist of About Time and WorkMax, Mike Merrill. Hello, and welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast. I am your host, Mike Merrill, and we are sitting down today with James Coyle, the co-founder of Event One Software and currently a transitional specialist after their acquisition by Insight Software. We asked James to come on the show today to discuss effective communication between the financial and operation teams. Welcome, James. Looking forward to the discussion today and I appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much, Mike, and, and uh, I appreciate your investment in this really important topic. And thanks to everyone who's listening to the podcast. You, you are most welcome, James. It's our pleasure to have you on. Um, before we get too deep into the conversation, I just have to say, you've got a very unique background and experience with technology as it relates to construction. Um, I, I know uh, going over some of the history that you and I have talked about over the years and, uh, and also just your background, you were actually in the room when Microsoft made that fatal decision to, or fateful, <laughs> fatal, <laughs> okay. Yeah, fateful or fatal, depends on the direction of perspective, right? Yeah. That's right. So, so on our call today, um, we wanted to um, discuss a little bit about your experience when you were in the room when Microsoft made that fateful decision to go after the personal computer market. That's a pretty crazy situation. So uh, tell us about that, and maybe uh, some more of your background, if you would. Yeah, well, thank you. There, um, so in the room where it happened, a little Alexander Hamilton game play here. The, uh, but tr truthfully, the history leading up to the interaction between Microsoft and IBM was was quite interesting. So I was at Timberline, I was a programmer and in support and in different capacities. And we were a, uh, had a business uh, systems that was going to center around OS2 from a graphical user interface, we were very excited. And for the record, I really liked OS2, but leading up to that, there was a lot of interaction about what the direction Microsoft was going, but it was behind the scenes. Not a lot of people at Microsoft knew. I think people at Timberline probably did know because Timberlake had a word processing and spreadsheet system for the PC that was actually pretty good. And when mm -hmm. it was just, and then Timberlake decided to discontinue it. And I remember the announcement thinking that we're an accounting solution and a vertical, and there's, that's our, where our business is. And there's not a lot of future in these little apps and stuff, you know, like the spreadsheets and word processors. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> kind of funny, just foreshadowing. And so I think maybe the direction that Microsoft was going, but really, yeah, they were just focusing on, oh, we're just going to do this little side thing. With, but they were the they were the wheelhouse behind the OS2, right? The, the and doing that for IBM. So when they kind of backed away, there was some puzzlement. But I think IBM didn't really question too much about that direction because they were leaders in technology. And at the time, like for people today, not thinking back back then, IBM was the deal. So to yeah. think that some upstart could have any impact on business, how people would, what technology people would use for business, it's like, okay, fine, go mess around with, you know, like the concept of personal computers, people are having them all over. I don't think that impressed people as much as it did a couple of years later. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah, it was pretty interesting uh, Forrest Gump moment, yeah. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, and, and to go all the way from that to right, smack dab in the middle of construction technology, which we know there's a digital revolution going on there, mobility's making a big play, yeah. um, lots, of, lots of different things that are evolving and changing continually. But one of the things that I think um, sometimes gets overlooked is the financial department. I mean, what has changed in their overall function in these last few years of this technology age? Well, you know, that's, it's very interesting. When I was, got was in development programming and support and sales through when I was recruiting and training resellers and then being working for a what became the largest business partner the main people we catered to and talked to and interacted with who made the decision was finance that mm -hmm. they were but then technology was really just more simplified right it was mostly I need 
a accounting system or a cost accounting system and I'm coming off of paper or whatever else. And so it all centered on that. All the other things that we have from a technology standpoint, like phones that you could use wherever, you know, and all that, none of that stuff was around. And so all through the 90s, still, it was a finance and, and construction accounting that was the most important, and the, which is kind of weird because the part of the organization that actually was out there that made the difference, whether you made money or not, operations, they were, they got what was left. When someone got around to it, they maybe they got a report to them and it was outdated mm -hmm. or whatever. And I remember being in, in different meetings uh, with companies uh, from an operations perspective and that frustration. Um, but uh, you know, a large chunk of the 90s, the focus was on finance. Then it began to change. So we, we got drawn into operations. Like I never gave much thought to it, but we created an Excel base. First, it was an access, but then an Excel base project cost forecasting workbook. I never thought much about it because historically we always just printed that and gave it to them. And that was the demand. And really, even after we created it, I thought, well, it was that one company. And then uh, um, a company that's pretty prominent in Tug historically, Arno Construction, saw it and they instantly recognized like, what's that? And they got it to deploy on uh, Palm devices. But really, remember, technology wasn't around. I never thought about it. Like, how do you even get it on a Palm device? That's a pretty small screen, you know? Um, but when you start to see where that began to change operations and owners like, oh, I gotta make money. Then I, the cycle switched with Primavera uh, and then Meridian getting into that market. Then more people tried to get into that space and the focus then was on operations to the point where we have Procore now. And then you have all this field technology. None of that stuff oh, existed. Yeah. You remember, you know, coming up in it. None of that stuff existed. And so, and a finance person would even know, know what to do with that. What does that mean? You know, what do, and then today, I remember being asked about this sort of thing just uh, in the last, like projecting what the new technology would be. And I said, wearable technology integrated through big data so that it's, it's it, it um, families with the other information. It will be the big game changer because you could count the steps and people are like, well, why does that matter? It's like, well, if you count the steps and you see the same number of steps every day and then today it's a lot less, something happened. You probably right. should know about that and ask questions, right? It's yeah, like, figure out how to right? duplicate it. Yeah. yeah. So it just came full circle. And then, and so I think that finance just got way behind and they were still looking at that age old way that people are doing finance when they were the most important people to talk to. And they, and they haven't come uh, forward in time. But I think today, like in the 90s, when the economy tanked, like I preached this for years, uh, like best practices and no one listened. And then when the economy tanked, people started listening to transparency for surety and bonding companies. Like mm -hmm. I need to know what's really going on, not guesses. And now today with all everything's going on here or like, is someone ill? Is there a protest or something going on? You don't know if those things are, how they're affecting you. And that affects cash. Yeah. For a finance person not to think that, so it, today finance has to be aware of the technology that's out there and utilize it um, from, from, a, from a reporting and, and family well with operations. You just don't have a choice not to do that. Yeah, it's interesting. Back in the day, it was like, oh, there must have been weather problems or yeah. there's an issue with permits. I mean, you know, it's, it's a different age right now. We, we have a, we had a, we created a report on a launch pad and people thought it was so revolutionary. Um, it occurred to me that like if a job address and all it was in Excel, like I was still coming up to speed, like, oh, all right, well, people are addicted to this Excel thing. I guess I got to try to figure out a way to make it work. It's the address. When you go to Google and you send someone a link, it, the address is embedded in the link. So I thought, well, you could just pass that. It's just programming. Right. And so we created a, a link so that the, the job status report could link to maps or the weather. And people were flabbergasted, like, wow, this is amazing. It's like, it's just pretty, you know, the state of the art, all the technology that was sitting out there and waiting out there, no one recognized. Right. Back then, it was just like a weather report or whatever. And you're guessing, it's not instantaneous. But there were people when that stuff was read, readily accessible, not incorporating it into their meetings and stuff, even though it had been out for a while, because no one questioned the status quo because we're making money. Why does it matter until it's harder to make money? Then you start to 
pay attention, I think. Right. Yeah. Well, which with the with those advancements, of course, now we have um, different different metrics that we can measure these key performance indicators or KPIs yes. and accountability goes up. What, how, were, how have those been impacted by these technological changes and advancements? Well, first, I mean, obviously technology has transformed what we can look at and know the state of our, our, our businesses, all sorts of key performance indexes. I think one of the biggest areas though, is that uh, whether people understand what's behind KPI and, and mm -hmm. the transparency, like how transparent is it, how those uh, KPIs are um, calculated and presented graphically or simple, generally don't know that much about it. They just say, well, if you use your systems, then these numbers mean that. And I think that um, I, like, someone whose job is no, like you buy a solution and it's got these KPIs and, and then you're making decisions and someone's, how do we know that the, these are accurate? And there's a pause before someone begins to say whatever they're saying. And that pause is a lot, like the visibility behind the KPIs. So I think what happened is a lot of people, when I implemented uh, construction companies, they did not understand their system. And it took the time to even understand it and understand their business and how the two related to each other and understand where things could go sideways, so that transparency wasn't there from a visibility standpoint. So as you march forward in time and technology keeps moving, people go, well, we got to really start using these dash stuff because everybody else is, but they get them and they don't even know like what they, what's behind them. So the KPIs are fantastic if people take the time to understand them, the visibility. Um, and so I think that, that that has been very transportive and how relevant the KPI is because of like wearable technology and things like that, collecting information from the field. You can't afford not to do that the, today. People who aren't doing that, like I, I'm flabbergasted. And then understanding how it incorporates into other things so that all the status of the job today and using that to project out the future are both taken into consideration. So did that answer your question? It, yeah, so I'm passionate yeah. about this. Yeah, yes, obviously. you are. <laughs> My passion about everything. There's a yeah, and there's a lot to unpack that you. I mean, you you mentioned a few things. Obviously, visibility, transparency, KPIs, yes. um, and and it makes me wonder how how do we create alignment between the field personnel and the office? Because obviously, the field has better tools to collect the data. Yes. Now the office has to act on that and give give a feedback loop so that. Um, those those teams are working in symphony together and what what are some secrets to make that happen more efficiently that, that's interesting so when i was a consultant in the 90s at the same time we were developing the technology that would become event one software my focus was getting operations and finance groups to work better together but at first i didn't even know what the differences were it wasn't until i started working with operations and what they needed and what and the state of technology and then got a sense for their feelings for the people in the office well they're just a bunch of overhead and blah 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 and <laughs> yeah. you know i get that perspective right um but they didn't they they threw the baby out with the bathwater it's like mm -hmm. well there are a lot of things to run a business and if you can't get bonding and you can't borrow money so that the cost of the money is less than what you're making you're not going to be making the big bonus so I think that I was successful getting them to understand that communicating information, they have a stake in it. And then the other, now I thought that the other way would be less challenging, mm -hmm. getting accounting to respect and work with um, construct the construction, the operations people. Right. And really it was harder because it was, Part of it, I think, is a lack of knowledge. Like, I don't know really what they do and what is compelling. And I want to know, but they aren't, they don't take the time to share and they dismiss me and whatever. I mean, there's some passive aggressive, not some. There's a lot of passive aggressive. There's a ton of tension, right, between mm -hmm. those two groups. So educating the finance people so that they have a somewhat of a better understanding of what is what you need. Like the personality of a project manager just frustrates a lot of finance people yeah. but you need to have that personality in order to do that job and and so you have to understand it's like you know those birds they have these wings and they're well you kind of need them if you're going to fly so you know <laughs> get past that just because you don't fly so getting the the two groups to understand 
each other's needs and how best to communicate. And, you know, so you got to those two things. And then what's, why do they need to communicate? Why is it important to really understand the field? And, and then why is it important for the field to be understood? All the rest is, isn't going to work unless those two things are done. And I, that was where I, I, people tried to rush past that. And the two groups would sit and they would be separated, their arms crossed, and they wouldn't talk or get along. So I was pretty good at being able to talk the, what the stakeholders and the, and the things and, and um, what they really need uh, to, to, in order to be able to effectively cooperate and communicate. Then we could begin, like number one, let's get operations, actionable information so that they can do their job. They need to play with the numbers, don't take that away, just protect the finance related numbers. Because you need to know what's going on in the field. And then the thing, well, they're just going to lie to themselves and me until it's too late. Well, they aren't doing it on their piece of paper or somewhere. So get them used to using certain technology that they use to run their job. And then without humble and making a bad person begin to share it, right? It's those kinds of things. I think that if there's operational people listening or finance people, they can relate to the kinds of things that we're talking about. And I'm mean, sure you had those experiences because you can talk to both parts. Yeah. You're pretty uh, unique in that with real life experience. Well, and I think the, the big thing, you know, and it's, it's not to disparage one side or the other at all. It's, it's just, it's, you know, one speaking Chinese, the other yeah. one speaking English, you know, it's just not the yeah. same language. And, and they both think that they're, right, you know, their role. In one or the other. And right. They, they feel like their role is yeah. the one that matters because to them it does because that's their job. But, um, right. you know, today what we what we continue to see and a lot of the guests that we've had to this point, um, what what seems to keep being the recurring theme is that we have data capture solutions to get live field data that's shared among both teams and then agree that these are the key metrics that each needs. And as long as the engine in the middle is calculating those, just to your point, so that the, the numbers are getting crunched in the financial manner, manner so that the office and the finance people, uh, you know, it speaks to them and what they need to know. But the field guys, they don't care about the dollars and cents. They want to know quantities and budgets. And of right. course, the challenge with like, that. We're talking it, about factors. If we're worrying about pennies, great. Let's worry about the pennies, but I just lost $10,000. What do you think is more important, right? For an operation person and a finance person. Well, the pennies matter. And, you know, it, both are right, as you said. Well, and the, yeah, and exactly the, I guess, really the sum of, of both of these is that they need one common platform or solution to communicate from each side. And, and then from there, they have the KPIs that matter to the field. They have the KPIs that matter to the finance office. And, uh, you know, ownership management, the teams that need to make those financial decisions and have all the data they need for the next projects that they're, you know, getting in the hopper. You're, you have hit it spot on. I mean, there are KPIs that there's areas that I think that they're just, there's distance and the two stakeholders, the two groups of stakeholders are not going to be on the same page. And, and that's okay, right? People think, well, they, we have to do everything the same on both areas. No, you don't. Operations technology should, should serve operations, but the information necessary for finance should distill from that. Finance has information that operations should need and should be given to them in a way and timely that is useful and reasonable, right? So both parties um, are, are served best by that. Um, I think that, I mean, I've heard all sorts of things on the periphery, but when we think about the getting to the position of respect, respecting why finance exists and then it's necessary and you don't have to know all the details, they know it, but you have to communicate in this way and finance accepting that an operational person is not a finance person and you don't want them to be, right? But they can agree to communicate certain things. These performance indexes that can be communicated, benchmarks, some kind of information that can then be utilized, field, um, status. I mean, I don't know how many people calculate whether they're on budget by the budget and cost, which is that's it. And there's no field relevance. It's like, seriously, well, we have a contract. And so it's like, just because you have a contract with someone and if they're underperforming and the work has to be done before other work gets done, 
You don't think that's going to have an impact and you you think you're protected on a project? You're not, you know, like they're, <laughs> they're going to fall through, you know, you need to know all of that stuff uh, regardless of, of, of whether you have a contract with someone to do it or if you have a crew that's mixed one way and the players are healthy and not infecting each other. There's so many things to keep your eye on today that you didn't even have uh, 10 years ago and it was hard back 10 years ago. So um, yeah, I think you need to focus, distill out what's most important and focus on getting that so that the numbers that, are, that people are working with are credible and you know what the dependencies are on those numbers. I think that's absolutely essential today. Yeah, so what one of the things that I'm hearing you say is that you've got uh, you got people in the field that you know they're very skilled at swinging a hammer or very very skilled at welding yeah. or yeah. doing something very specific to their role and and the finance people don't need them to understand what their job is they need to focus on on the production out in the field the labor and yeah and I bet it annoys them uh, when someone's counting saw blades that got broken or or one guy someone took one home. It's like, they're like, who cares? Let's get the job done, right? Well, someone's watching those things. And I think it annoys the person doing the job and vice versa, the, uh, the finance person goes, yeah, but I'm responsible for accounting for things. I can't, no one's gonna accept for me waving my hand going, I don't know, but tolerance, a certain degree of tolerance on both parties is, is important. And, and then a, a desire to understand. Yeah, yeah both. Right, that, that'll allow them both to sides think that they understand the big picture and the other side may not. And I think that's the challenge. Yeah. There's there's one big picture and then there's two semi big pictures and, and each of them have one of those. And it all Mike, needs I to think you just summed up our society as a whole. You're yeah. well done. You could use this uh, interaction for and you apply it to really a lot of things. But nice. Yes, I agree with you 100%. So, so one of the things, um, you know, there's a couple of areas that I know you and I have, we've known each other for 15, 20 years, long time. Uh, we, we work with a lot of mutual clients, a lot of, lots of similar companies out in the industry. And um, one of the things that I hear, and, and I know you've heard too, is um, companies will have what they call dump codes, or they'll, they'll have kind of a slush fund area yeah. that, they, that they bury costs that are overrun yes. from a budget. What, what are the dangers of things like that, that, that companies are facing? Well, like when I first started thinking about it, I thought, okay, so the, the opposite of that is the illusion of accuracy and accountability. I have everything coded and that's, those are the right numbers. People will do that and wave their hand as if that really is the, the truth. I think the first thing is let's be real about what the information is and how accurate it is, how, how, how your ability to account. If you don't have the practices in place from the beginning to take your expectations, transform them into real life, actionable, right? The expectations mm -hmm. that I'm going to conduct the project on, that's your first danger point in having these little, I mean, a certain degree of this, like, I don't know where to put this amount. I mean, that's fine, right? Uh, overhead. Um, in the office and things like that, the finance, CFO is like allocating them against, uh, across jobs. A certain amount is you're just not going to get away from it. But if you don't start a project with an idea of what what my expectations are and how I'm actually going to produce this profitably and allocate it realistically, and then keep coming back to that and checking in with that, then this fund that is uh, moving dollars around that I've seen mm -hmm. and you're referring to is going to grow. And there's huge danger because like right off the bat, I'm sure it was like, the, the, that's, there's no expectation tied to that money. There's no expectation and then how did I do? So it's just a big pool of unknown and they don't, they're not gonna be comfortable, sorry, with that unknown at all. Like the people who you need in order to be able to say, I can conduct this work profitably and finish the job. And the surety says, well, I don't believe you. I'm not bonding. You know, there's a danger there, right? There's, and then the, pro, then the project manager goes, oh, we do need them. I mean, they wouldn't just bond, you know, there's, you know, and, or that money costs something. So I have to account for it against expectations. So I know, because I don't have all that money is laying around. So, so the bigger that number is that's, that's in that unknown grouping. And I've seen people, they'll go, oh, well, we want to budget shift money. 
-hmm. that there's a big difference. The earlier it happens on a project, mm -hmm. I think the more realistic the shifting is. So if an estimator comes up with my estimate to get a bid, all right, now, do they really know what their estimate was and, is, and what it was based on where the risks? I don't know, always, right? They go, well, I had to do it or we wouldn't have got the job. The project manager, someone has to look at that and go, okay, set that aside. This is what it's gonna cost to get this job done and this is how I'm gonna do it. Now, how much money do I have here? Right, mm -hmm. and then they're looking at going. That's not enough. You know? right, <laughs> yeah, just, right. You better know that. Don't pretend it's not enough, or it is enough when it isn't. It's right. like, well, we need to get as close to it being enough, right? It keeps people employed and all that. So right off the bat, um, taking the estimate and allocating it the way you're going to build it. But the other part in the challenge I've seen is there's. It's like I have my way as an operational person of organizing my expectation. Finance has this rigid structure they got this general ledger thing i don't know what that thing is at all and then they've got this csi construction specification institute of codes and i don't think that they're all that accurate but they want to confine me to that well that's mm -hmm. fine but i actually have to do the job so right. this and then i have to communicate to the customer who might have a completely different way and uh, finance doesn't worry about that until they have to bill the person so mm -hmm. operations has to sit down and get everything laid out in a way that they, they can with operational people, but I'll communicate to finance. And I think that is challenged. The earlier they do that, right, in the cycle, um, and the more streamlined you are, the less you're going to have this big, I don't want to say it's a slush fund, it's a pool of unknown. But, right. but the thing is, my, you and I both have seen, I've seen people meticulously account for things. And I'm like, what is that number based on? Well, it's, that's the number. It came from where it's like, how does that have any semblance in reality right. i don't see any field related stuff that they're even working with that right and and they're making business decisions on mm -hmm. what is that number they're making <laughs> and so i'm passionate like well, let's not lie to ourselves right so well it, yeah it makes me think of the the statement that we hear all the time you know um if it ain't broke don't fix it or this yes. is the way we've always done it this is yes. just the way we do it and that could go for the field or the office right yes yep that's the one, that's one comment that is, has a historical frustration. And mm -hmm. the other comment is that people make technology decisions, implementation decisions that affect people, large, potentially people. large number of people yeah. without understanding its impact on the other technology and organization, right? Like we're going to change from this and this, and I just made that decision. And you have no idea what that's going to do, or if the person could even use that technology. Right. And, right. and IT people will do that. And it, I'll look at it going, no, the right way to go about this is we, we look at how our company is going to operate and what we need and, and, and how the software has to weather. And then we make our decisions within that. And when we make changes, no changes made. Just because your neighbor says, oh, you should buy XYZ. What the heck does the neighbor know? I mean, I'm gonna, <laughs> you need to know that it resonates with the rest yeah. of your technology. And IT people tend to go, well, everyone else is using blah, blah, blah. And that, that it's better, like 64 bit Microsoft Office. I, tons of people, are like, oh, it's, that's the thing. And I, as I dig deep, you get to the IT person it's like, do you really know what you're, the only thing that resonates is that that is the standard and it's a pain to put on 32 bit. I get that, I understand that, that is a real cost. It's a pain, but they'll go, well, we have big spreadsheets. And I'm like, there's multi-billion dollar companies with a lot bigger spreadsheets on 32 bit. That's not a answer. I, wrong, you know, but IT people will pat each other on the back and say, yeah, that's how I make a decision. And, you know, I, so I'm saying that there are legitimate business decisions and a drive toward technology, but there's a, there are people will go down a path and, and they're like cows. I, sometimes I'm down this path out here in this field. And all of a sudden you don't realize that there are fences around you. At first they were a long way away. You never saw the fences and then they're closer and pretty soon you realize, what is that? Well, that's a fence. What's, what's that mean? It means we're not here for all that. The closer those things get, the less time we have, right? They don't realize that. They're, they're like, I, 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 and so technology decisions can be like that. We, we make decisions and pretty soon we find ourselves confined by the, the limitations of whatever the technology is. And, and someone says, how did we get here? How do we ever make a decision that we're gonna do this when this mission critical thing didn't work with that? Well, 
<laughs> because you didn't follow very good process. So that's my other area is not just going to the latest and greatest because it's the latest and greatest, right? Lots of people have all sorts of gadgets and stuff in their house that they don't use. They seem great, but when you actually need, when, when push comes to shove and you're stressed, you go to the, your habits and the status quo. It needs to be intuitively incorporated and you know, training can overcome that to an extent, I think, but right. There's a lot here, Mike, I'm sorry. You asked me a question, it opens up a whole can, but I think that you understand what I'm saying and appreciate it. I can see some pain in your eyes. So you, you feel it too, from your past experience of, of uh, as a technology provider and a consumer of technology. And I think that the people listening to this can relate to that. Well, it's the, yeah, you're, you're, you're really spot on. I, I think, as I look back, uh, there's so many things that we wish we could do over. And yes. if you just, you know, everybody says, if you could just go back and, you know, make that decision again. And my, my whole technology career has been uh, basically trying to repent from the sins of the past, the yes. things that I didn't do well and wish I would have. And so I try and share that pain and that wisdom yes. gained with those that, you know, are, are making those same decisions today and hopefully not the wrong ones. The worst of vendors are technology companies, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're a technology company and you make a decision that. Right. Like, how do that? like, well, the most important thing is that sales can actually operate and we can follow up with our customers. If it doesn't aid our communication with our customers, prospects and existing ones, then it, get rid of it, right? And, right? and so, well, we need this because it's state of the art. It's like, well, you just eliminated my way to timely communicate with customers. Did you not pay attention to what was most important to the company? Technology companies make that mistake. So it, we're human, right? And, and, uh, and we're all attracted by everybody's going in this direction. Maybe I should too. And no plan to, to, to make sure that, that you can utilize that within what you're capable of using as a team right? Mm -hmm. You get a, a highly motivated, good, intelligent people, you know, not the most, it doesn't matter, but they're motivated and they communicate with each other, um, working together with even AIDS technology, and they will outperform these smart people with the newest technology that aren't on the same page and aren't tuned into the their most important criteria that is pro profits are tied to. Absolutely. Yeah, and if I read between the lines in your comment there, you, uh, I think, what you're stating is effective communication between the teams is really the secret in the middle. It's Absolutely. not just a new system or a better system. It's yes. communication first. The systems are supposed to serve that. But, mm -hmm. you know, look at where technology was. Once upon a time, we didn't have, I mean, when I first got hired by this one uh, um, technology reseller, I learned a fax machine so I could fax a proposal. And they go, well, why do you need a fax? Now, faxes were newer, okay, but... It's like, well, everybody has, them. I need the facts so I can get it down there. So I don't have to drive down town Cleveland from outside, right? I don't know, it depends on when I have to leave and I didn't want to do it. And they were like, well, you know, don't buy technology just for the sake of buying it was, I think was, was the point. But you look, you go forward in time to other technology decisions that people have made and I have made, you're right. And, and it's like, do I really need this? How is it going to help? Well, sometimes, the technology is amazing. Like, like this, a mobile device is a fantastic tool. And it's, it can also be the bane of our existence. What do you mean? I'm quick, very responsive. When I get an email, I respond. And when I get an, um, a text, I respond. And this is supposedly a phone. And no <laughs> one picks it up and talks to people, right? Right? And it's, all, right. it's like communication has to be personable. You have to know what that person is and what's going on in their life. And but people use technology to get away from those things, mm -hmm. and, and and without even being aware. And I think that a lot of people listen, going, "Oh my God, yeah, that's right," because you know, yeah. And I do the same thing. That was that was Everybody very does. insightful. What you shared that the technology is supposed to serve that communication process and not the other way around. Replace where we're a slave it. Slave to the technology. Right. If it if it aids in timely communication responsiveness, great. But there's, you have, to, but remember that I said, what people don't do is they don't set up, here's our business, here's how we operate. So what's our mantra? What's our, what's, what's really our KPI? Well, we need to touch our customers blah, blah, blah times. 
Well, I did by email and text. No, you missed the human element. Right. And it's the bane of a lot of existences. The difference between a service company being called back uh, or me tolerant rating some issue and really all the companies, right? And so when the communi I, where you're highly effective communicating timely and everything, but you missed the human element, they didn't get the email and you never knew it. You just mm -hmm. assume they did. Right. If you don't pick up the phone and call and confirm every now and then at least, you don't get that. And so now the technology that, that dialed in more and more and more on timely communication began to not serve the, its core purpose. And where a phone doesn't act as a phone anymore. It's right. so funny, right? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Well, this has been a very enjoyable conversation. I've had a lot of fun today. And we could probably go on another couple hours, I'm sure. Yes. And <laughs> so easily would be fun. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we'll have, have you to, back sometime. Yeah, we'll we'll need to do that for sure. So I guess just in wrapping up, one of the questions that I like to ask uh, each guest at the end is: Is there a hack or a, a kind of a superpower or something that James Coyle kind of does, and something that you try and embody that you've learned over the years that's really served you in your career that others might be able to learn from? Well, my biggest superpower, the thing that's differentiated me all along mm. was my desire to interact with, actively listen, communicate to the person. So I really heard them, right? And that I communicate and follow up, right? So that's how our technology was built. We're the smartest people out there, but we listened to what people wanted, built something they could use, and then we kept checking in with them. It's that person contact, but really listening. And I think a lot of times people listen to get their point um, confirmed, right? Like, oh, at some point they said this, so that validated our decision, let's move forward. It's like, did you actually listen to what they were saying? That was just one right. thing they said. So that's the biggest superpower is I, I think I do a pretty good job on that. Well, great. Well, very insightful. And again, thank you so much for joining us today, James. This has been fantastic and we'll definitely have to have you on again. And talk a little bit more shop. Absolutely, Mike. My, my pleasure. And thanks uh, to you uh, for this investment in, in the people and really the industry in general. That's what I love is that we're improving the experience for all these folks, not just making a profit at someone's expense, but improving their experience. I'm passionate about that. Thank you. I really appreciate you doing this. Absolutely. We're on the same page there. Wanna, we, we're, uh, we're all in this together. So. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, James. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the Mobile Workforce Podcast today, sponsored by About Time Technologies and WorkMax. If you like the conversation or were able to gain insightful tips or tricks, give us a follow on Instagram at WorkMax underscore and subscribe to the show on iTunes or your preferred podcast platform, and you'll never miss another insightful episode. Also, if you enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating and review and share the show with your friends and colleagues. Our goal is always to help you improve your business and improve your life.